Convening having arrived, the Senate will come to order. Would ask that all unauthorized visitors exit the chamber at this time, and the Senate will come to order. Chair recognizes the Distinguished Rules Committee Chairman, the Senator from the 53rd. Mr. President, such a glorious day at our state capitol. The men and women of the Senate is ready to go to work for the people of Georgia. A moment in history, November 15th, 1984, light heavyweight champion uh, Evander Holyfield won a match this day against Lionel Bryan in, uh, at the Madison Square Garden. And today, his son, Elijah Holyfield, is running like a prize fighter. Yeah. The journal's been read and found to be correct. Thank you, Senator, for your good works on the journal. Is there objection to dispensing with the reading of the journal? Reading of the journal is dispensed with. Is there objection to the confirmation of the journal? Chair hears none, and the journal is confirmed. Secretary will read a message from the House. The following message was received from the House through Mr. Riley, the clerk thereof. Mr. President, the House is adopted by the requisite constitutional majority the following resolution of the House. H.R. 1 E.X. by Representative Burns of the 159th, the resolution to notify the Senate that the House of Representatives has convened and for other purposes. The House has adopted the following resolution of the Senate. SR 3 EX by Senator Miller of the 49th the resolution to notify the governor that the General Assembly has been convened and for other purposes. The Speaker has appointed a committee of notification on the part of the House of the following members, Representative Rhodes of the 120th, Rogers of the 10th, F. Stration of the 104th, Silcox of the 52nd, Blackman of the 146th, Ballinger of the 23rd, and Larikia of the 169th. Mr. President, that completes the order. The House has convened. Any senators having bills and resolutions to introduce, please bring them to the secretary's desk at this time. It is now time for the morning roll call. Time for the morning roll call. Are there any motions to excuse? Chair, now recognize Senator from the 20th, Senator from Perry. Good morning, Mr. President. I re request unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the 18th for business inside the Capitol. 18th, without objection, Senator from the 18th will be excused. Chair, recognize Senator from the 31st. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask unanimous consent to excuse the Senator from the 16th. 16th, without objection, the Senator from the 16th will be excused. Chair recognizes the Senator from Albany, Georgia, Senator from the 12th. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to excuse a Senator from the Second. Second. Without objection, Thank Senator you. from the second will be excused. Chair, now recognize Senator from the 51st. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for unanimous consent to um, excuse the Senator from the 16th, still on work outside the Capitol. 16th. Without objection, Senator will be excused. Chair, recognize Senator from the 29th. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to excuse the Senator from the 48th. 48th. Without objection, Senator from the 48th will be excused. Any other motions to excuse? Senators, please signify your presence by voting the A switch. Secretary will unlock the machine. It is now time for our morning devotion and would ask that all senators please take your seats and cease all audible conversation 
as we are preparing the chamber for our morning devotion. Doorkeepers, if you would, please secure the chamber at this time. It is now my distinct honor to recognize the Senator from the 49th to lead us in our pledge and introduce our chaplain of the day. Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the Georgia flag. I pledge allegiance to the Georgia flag and the principles for which it stands, wisdom, justice, moderation. Thank you, Mr. President. It gives me great pleasure to be here today among my colleagues to introduce uh, Reverend Jane Newman Brooks. And I was thinking that I would ask her to lead the state pledge. What do you think? <laughs> Nobody knows the state pledge, but I've always wanted to do that to a chaplain. We want you to lead the state pledge. But uh, Jane Brooks is a, a, a fine individual, and she uh, is a family-in-law. She's married to my, my cousin, David Brooks. And they're natives of Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, she's a lifelong resident of Georgia. She uh, graduated from Lakeside High School, Georgia State University, and the Candler School of Theology at Emory University. She was ordained as a minister in the North Georgia Conference of the United Methodist Churches in 1983. I'd ask my colleagues to give uh, Reverend Jane Newman Brooks a warm Senate welcome. Well, good morning. Mr. President, Senator Miller, members of the Georgia Senate, honored guests and friends, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning, and I thank you for this opportunity. On behalf of 360,000 United Methodists across the North Georgia Conference, which is the northern half of the state, and on the behalf of our bishop, Bishop Sue Harper Johnson, I bring you greetings. I understand that one of the reasons that you're here this week is to work on appropriations to help citizens in South Georgia following the hurricanes. And I'm pleased to tell you uh, that United Methodists here in North Georgia are in solidarity with you as you give aid to our um, friends in South Georgia. Uh, we've been sending certified emergency relief teams and thousands and thousands of dollars to South Georgia to help with that relief. And we are committed to continue to do that until all of the work is done. So we're grateful for your work here as well. I received instructions today about this devotional. I know I'm not to take more than five minutes, and for some reason I'm not supposed to sing. I'd love to know the story behind that, why singing is not allowed during the devotional. There must be something there to tell. One week ago today, our fourth grandchild was born, a beautiful little boy. As I held and cuddled him a few hours after his birth, I looked into his precious sleeping face and I found myself wondering, what would his first words be? Would it be Dada? Mama? Maybe he would say my grandmother name first, Nana. I chose it when our first grandchild was born because I knew that that word Nana was a name that would roll easily off of the tongue of a baby grandchild, and that maybe that would be the first word that that child would speak. What was your first word? Learning to talk just kind of happens, doesn't it? We, we do it without realizing. It's an interesting experience. First, there are a few simple words, and, and then we begin to string together phrases and sentences. We gather those words even further into paragraphs. And before long, the miracle of language comes forth and we're able to really communicate. I'm still learning to talk. And I expect that each of you are learning to talk as well. We live in a time and a place where many of us are finding that it's difficult to talk with one another especially around controversial topics. And I'm afraid, by our example, we're teaching our children and our grandchildren to talk over each other, 
more than we're teaching them to talk with each other. I fear that we're teaching our children and our grandchildren to talk about those with whom we disagree rather than teaching them how to have conversations with persons who have different ideas from what we may have. I think that we would do well every now and then if we would stop and listen to ourselves. What are my words and your words teaching those who are listening? We who are citizens of this great state, and neighbors and family and senators and other elected leaders, <coughs> we certainly are not going to agree on everything. And wouldn't it be boring if we did? <coughs> But may we agree together that we're not going to model the world's bad habit of not being able to have healthy, constructive conversation. Can I have this? I think, yes. <coughs> I, think I got your crud. <coughs> <coughs> we need to model how to have healthy, constructive conversations. We want to be people who listen to one another with great intention of learning from one another. We want to be people who appreciate one another. We want to be people who can extend an ear and a hand to people who don't always think like we do. I think one of God's greatest desires for us <coughs> I think one of God's greatest desires for us is that we would grow deeper in our ability to talk with each other respectfully and to learn to be neighbors together, even in our disagreements. I want to share with you what the Apostle Paul said in his letter to the church at Philippi. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent, if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things, all that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. Amen.
If I could have the Senate's attention for just a moment, I would like to present the doctor of the day, and to do so, I recognize the distinguished senator from the 42nd. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, colleagues, it's my honor to introduce our doctor of the day to you, um, Dr. Andrea Juliao. She is a, has been practicing family medicine in Tucker, Georgia for over 17 years. She works for Emory Specialty Associates with Emory Decatur Hospital. She grew up in DeKalb County and attended public schools, received her bachelor's degree from Emory University, her medical degree from the Medical College of Georgia, and um, completed her family medi medicine residency at the Atlanta Medical Center. She's a member of the American Academy of Family Practice, the Georgia Academy of Family Medicine, and the American Medical Association. She's actively involved with the DeKalb Medical Society uh, and has served as its president. She is married to Moses Juliao, and they have three children, Anna, who attends the University of Georgia, Audrey, who attends the University of North Georgia, and the youngest, Jacob, who is a sophomore at Lakeside High School in DeKalb. She's an active member of her church, Bridgepoint Church in Decatur, and serves as a deacon there. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Juliao. Well, good morning. Good morning. Again, my name is Dr. Andrea Juliao, and I just appreciate the opportunity and honor to come down to the state capitol and serve as a doctor of the day. As stated, I was born and raised in this wonderful state of Georgia and truly love this state. As a family medicine doctor who serves the health needs of her community, I recognize the value of service and sacrifice. I want to thank you, the legislators, for your hard work and commitment to serve the people of Georgia. We, the physicians of Georgia, care about our patients and appreciate the efforts of this legislative body that are focused on ensuring we have a strong health care system for all in Georgia. Thank you again for allowing me to speak, and blessings to you all today. Let me have the Senate's attention for just a moment. Uh, yesterday, obviously, was our first day of our special session, which we um, honored um, our good friend uh, who passed away, John Meadows, and we have uh, the resolution prepared today that we would like to read. So the Secretary will read a resolution. Senate Resolution 6EX by Senator Miller of the 49th and others, a resolution honoring the life and memory of John Meadows and for other purposes. Whereas the state of Georgia mourns the loss of one of its most distinguished citizens with the passing of Representative John Meadows, and whereas he proudly served as a guardian of this nation's freedom and liberty with the United States Marine Corps, and whereas he diligently and conscientiously devoted innumerable hours of his time, talents, and energy toward the betterment of his community and state as evidenced dramatically by his superlative service as a member of the Calhoun City Council, mayor of Calhoun, and six-term representative of the 5th District. And whereas numerous roles in civic involvement and committee memberships led to his role as chairman of the House Rules Committee, and whereas he gave inspiration to many through his high ideals, morals, deep concern for his fellow citizens, and the devotion, patience, and understanding he demonstrated to his family and friends were admired by others. And whereas his dedication to his community and state were surpassed only by his devotion to his wife, Marie, his two remarkable children, BJ and Missy, and his three wonderful grandchildren, Will, Patrick, and Maxwell. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate that the members of this body join in honoring the life and memory of John Meadows and express their deepest and most sincere regret at his passing. That completes the order. Without objection, the resolution is adopted, and uh, we are certainly uh, very mindful the funeral is Saturday, uh, I think at 2 o'clock, and I know many of you will want to attend, and obviously we want to conduct our business, so uh, that
that will be available uh, to uh, show and pay our respects. Uh, we have another resolution. We would like to honor a very special guest uh, and member of our, our body. Um, and Secretary will read a resolution. Senate Resolution 7EX by Senator Albers of the 56 and others, a resolution recognizing and commending Senator Fran Miller on his outstanding public service and for other purposes. Whereas Senator Fran Miller has long been recognized by the citizens of this state for the vital role that he has played in leadership and his deep personal commitment to the welfare of the citizens of Georgia. And whereas nothing is more vital to the future of our state than the education of our young people, and Senator Fran Miller has exemplified the commitment as chair of the Senate Higher Education Committee, as a member of the Senate Education and Youth Committee, and as a member of several statewide commissions and boards to reform and improve Georgia's educational system for all students. And whereas a man of deep and abiding faith who put God's fir God first, Senator Miller is an active member of Dunwoody United Methodist Church, and his compassion for those who are less fortunate, his generosity, and his determination are well known throughout his community. And whereas Senator Fran Miller has served with honor and distinction with the Georgia General Assembly and his vision and unyielding commitment to representing the citizens of his district and educating the youth of this state have set the standard for public service. And whereas it, it is abundantly fitting and proper that the outstanding accomplishments of this remarkable and distinguished Georgian be appropriately recognized. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate that the members of this body recognize and commend Senator Fran Miller for his humble, effective, unselfish, and dedicated public service to the state of Georgia and extend the most sincere best wishes for his continued health and happiness. Mr. President, that completes the order. Is there objection to adoption of the resolution? The chair hears none and the resolution is adopted. Uh, it is uh, a great honor to um, pay our uh, special uh, tribute to a colleague of ours who we've all uh, grown to love and respect and uh, appreciate uh, his uh, selfless sacrifice that he has made in his life of public service. And everywhere he's been, he's always left it better. And uh, we will certainly uh, miss him in this uh, very august body, but we will be always cherish uh, the memories that we have of, uh, of Fran Miller. Some of us will cherish those memories uh, some of us will reflect upon those memories in ways that will bring laughter uh, and all types of other emotions. Uh, Fran. <laughs> but one thing we will all be very thankful of is that we will no longer have any special cities by which he will be trying to put in place. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but so many great, great memories and uh, uh, just a wonderful, beautiful life uh, of service. And as I shared with him uh, after the election, as I called him, that uh, he has a, a beautiful, beautiful future to look forward to. And the beauty is representative of individuals that are behind me right now, a beautiful wife, a wonderful family and grandkids that he's going to get to spend a lot more time with. And I know that this new chapter of his life is going to be very beautiful and very special and one that he will cherish. But he uh, has served with great distinction, and we uh, love Fran, uh, admire him, and appreciate him so very much. And to speak to the resolution, it is now my honor to call upon the distinguished senator from the 56. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Fran Miller is one of my closest and dearest friends in this building. And while he may not be walking in these doors uh, come January, we know that we're going to rely on him heavenly. Sa Fran's service to others is truly extraordinary. There are not too many people more accomplished than him that have ever served both in the House and the Senate. And as Lieutenant Governor just said, through his family, 
being a dedicated husband, father, grandfather. We know how much he loves and dotes on his family every day. His incredible success in business, and he brought those very skills here to our body and to the people. The service in his church, charities. The people of DeKalb County may never truly understand the goodness that he brought to those county folks, as well as to the cities he created, the local control which are now thriving. Every student that walks into a classroom in this state, whether it be K through 12, a technical college, or a university, are better off because Fran Miller served. Every small business is better off today because Fran Miller served. Every person in this body is better off because Fran Miller served. We are truly left with a legacy. Thank you so much for serving and being a part of our family. We love you, Fran. Godspeed. break the rules today again because uh, I'm not going to can't see far enough to see everybody's district but have to laugh at the gentleman from the 53rd over the rules chairman holding up the sign the, the Senate used to refer to me as the Shah of the cab I told him after the election the Shah has been, been deposed but he's still in exile he's still alive so uh, I can't tell you uh, I'll try to tell you without breaking down here as I look around this room and Think of people like when I came down here 20 years ago, Lester Jackson, Renee Arnerman, Gloria Butler. Uh, lots changed in 20 years. In many ways, it's a lot like uh, Little League. I coached baseball, I don't know, 35, 40 years ago now, of Murphy Candler Park. Now I've had grandkids coming through the program. It's the same kids, it's different faces, just like you in this room are from when I started 20 years ago. I look back at some of the pictures. And uh, I will tell you, I had the pleasure of serving in the house. I was trained, house trained, not the house broken. Uh, and uh, when I came over here to the Senate, now it'll be eight years. Uh, this whole experience, the whole 20 years, I wouldn't have traded this for anything in the world. I've served in the minority. I've served in the majority. I've done battles with people. And yet, we're not Washington, D.C. We walk out of here and we drink coffee together, have a drink together, whatever. And, uh, and we move forward, and the state moves forward. Uh, and the state will continue to move forward, whether it be under Republicans, under Democrats, whatever. Because one thing I've learned being down here all these years, at least 95% of us that have the opportunity to serve here are here for the right reasons. We may disagree on some things, but at the end of the day, I think our hearts are in the right place. I, uh, I will miss this, there's no doubt about that. Not so much if, you know, is there that much left that I really wanted to accomplish, if you will, as a legislator, but I'll miss the people in the halls, I'll miss my bodyguard in the back of the room there, okay, and I'll miss you all, um, simply because what we do here is important. What we're doing this week is important. There's people that are devastated in this state because of this hurricane. And what we do here to try to help them is so, so important. So again, uh, this is certainly a, a real treat for me to be up here at the Rostrum, be here with my family. And uh, you know, whether it was the little girl intern, I can still say that, can't I? You can still say that, look, young lady intern, okay. Um, can't say enough for the people I've had the opportunity to share sweets with. My buddy Josh back here. Donna, the redneck woman who takes care of me all day long. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, uh, you know. I mean, how many people have an assistant who rides motorcycles? Come on, I mean, really, come on. You know, I'm, I'm, used, to, I'm used to being controlled, sort of, <laughs> sort of. But again, um, 
enough, I guess, at this point. I, again, I, uh, this means an awful lot, you know. The staff, you know, the people in the Senate research, you know, the people in the press office. God, this poor guy's in the lieutenant governor's office as well as Irene that had to listen to me come in there and whine and complain and, you know, you know, people like Bill and people like Butch and, and the rest of you for putting up with me. But uh, all I can say is uh, thank you all so much. God bless Georgia. Thank you. Okay, let me have the Senate's attention for a moment. Um, before we begin our points of personal privilege, let me ask that um, senators go ahead and take your seats. Um, we, have a, we have a very special guest uh, that is present with us today in the Senate that I would like to, to recognize. I remember back in the day when Pierre Howard was Lieutenant Governor. And during that time, it was a little contentious and oftentimes senators that are in your seat, as I was a senator during that time, uh, would maybe envision yourself being the Lieutenant Governor. And oftentimes questioning the Lieutenant Governor and doing all kinds of um, of maneuvering and one day Pierre Howard from this very rostrum said I want to remind every single senator in this chamber 
that there's only one lieutenant governor. And if you want to be lieutenant governor, you need to go out and raise $4 million and get 50 plus 1 percent of the vote across the state of Georgia. Well, today we have an individual who did just that in order to become the lieutenant governor elect. And I am so very proud of Jeff Duncan, uh, not only the race by which he uh, ran, but also uh, the platform in which he will uh, bring to this wonderful body. He's going to serve with great distinction and be a remarkable uh, lieutenant governor. And I am very, very honored to have him here today and would like to present to you Lieutenant Governor-elect Jeff Duncan. Thank you all so much. Um, it's hard to put into words what an honor it is to stand here uh, and to see so many great friends. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been two years since we started this journey, our family, and it has been one of the hardest, longest journeys our family's ever traveled, uh, my wife and our three young boys, but it is one that has been worth traveling. Uh, it's hard to describe how excited we are to be here and to be able to be a part of this team as we move forward, and, and y'all are in a great place. Uh, uh, Mr. President, it is uh, such an honor to be able to step into this place and be able to continue the trajectory that we have here in Georgia. This is a great place to run your business. It's a great place to raise your family, and I look forward to continuing to work with each and every one of you to make sure that uh, we move forward with that. Um, I also look forward to building relationships. Right? That's, that's who I am. Jeff Duncan, as a businessman, as a member of the community, is one about building relationships. And I look forward to building relationships with each of you, not just political relationships, but relationships that understand your districts that understands your families, understands your values, understands your mission. And so that's what I want to do as the next lieutenant governor is to make sure that we put our best foot forward each and every day, and I help you put your best forward each and every day. So uh, this, this chamber has treated me really well over the years. Uh, I've never sent a piece of legislation over here that didn't pass and become a law. Uh, so I've got a great track record, and you all have been a big part of this process for me. And I look forward to continuing to pace the, the, the places that we want to go here forward in Georgia. Um, look, our best days are in front of us. You all know that. Our best days are truly in front of us here in Georgia, and there's a lot of great things we can continue to do. We can continue to better educate our kids and continue to grow an economy and continue to improve health care, and I look forward to partnering with all of you all on that. Um, I think our mission profiles not just lead ourselves here in Georgia, but be able to do things that are bold enough to lead an entire nation on some of the big issues. So look forward to working with each and every one of you all. Thank you all so much for what, you've, uh, what you're doing currently and what we're going to continue to do forward. Thank you. It is um, now time for points of personal privilege. Points of personal privilege. Um, Chair and I, Senator from the 39th, on a point of personal privilege. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. President. I am here today um, because I'm sure, like many of you, you went home last night or woke up this morning and saw a familiar face on the news. Not just our local Atlanta news, but national news. And it was not something that I prepared for yesterday, not something that I planned for, and it is something that breaks my heart today that I have to stand here and address. I was elected not even a year ago to this body as a senator representing the 39th district. And from what I've been told, there's lots of history that comes with representing the 39th district, but that was not my plan yesterday. When I woke up yesterday morning and got my three-year-old son ready for daycare and took him and dropped him off, it was not my intent for him to hear Senator Nakima Williams was just arrested on the radio and tell the babysitter, that's not Nakima, that's mommy. But that's what my Carter said, because that's what he heard on the radio yesterday. We take a pledge every day in this body to uphold the principles 
of Georgia wisdom, justice, and moderation, and justice was not upheld yesterday. I was standing upstairs on the third floor of the Capitol, and I heard a lot of commotion downstairs. I saw the crowds gathering. I saw Capitol Police with the twist ties on their ready to arrest people. I looked over the banister and asked what was going on, and they told me that there was a protest. I sat there with friends waiting for the house to convene, and then I heard a glass break. That's when I headed to the elevator to go and find out what was going on downstairs because there was a glass breaking and there was a lot of commotion. I went downstairs and I stood there and I listened to Capitol Police as they tried to explain what the rules were and what would lead to arrest. I did not put on my to-do list to get arrested yesterday. I did not plan to go to the Fulton County Jail and to tell that I had to take my clothes off and be strip searched. I am a member of this body and I stood with my constituents in the rotunda of the Capitol and the Capitol Police handcuffed me and took me to jail. I stayed in the Fulton County Jail for over five hours yesterday with criminals from all walks of life. I don't know what they did, but I know I didn't deserve to be there. I got out last night and I went home and I held my child and I laid in bed with my husband and we talked about what today would bring. And he asked if I wanted to stay home today. And there was a little bit inside of me that honestly wanted to stay in bed and wanted to stay home, but that's not who I am. That's not what I was elected to do. And I will always stand up for what is just, what is fair, and what is right. And that's what I did yesterday. I didn't yell at anybody. I didn't say anything to obstruct anyone from doing their job or their business on the floor. What I did was I stood with my constituents as they wanted their voices to be heard. And I hope that each of you would always stand with your constituents because that is what we're sent here to do. So I'm back here today because I'm not going anywhere. I was just reelected with no opposition, so you're stuck with me for at least two more years. And I'm gonna be here and I'm gonna continue to stand up for what I believe in, what I was sent here to do. I'm not gonna disrupt anybody doing their work because we're all here for the same reason, because we want what's best for those that we represent back home. So I am looking forward to having a conversation with Governor Dill and anyone else who is willing to listen because this should not have happened to me yesterday. It should not happen to anyone else. And I would hope that you would stand with me because yesterday it was me, but tomorrow it could be one of you. So I hope that you'll stand with me and make sure that no one else is treated the way that I was treated yesterday by standing up for my constituents and standing peacefully in the rotunda of the Capitol, a body that I serve in, but I was taken to jail. Thank you. Chair recognized Senator from the 10th on a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President and members of this body. I rise in support of my colleague from the 39th. And I just want to share a story with you that some kind of way made me part of her story. Uh, I was downstairs in the leader's office and we were having a conversation when I received word that one of our members had been arrested. We immediately got up, left, we went outside and what I observed was that uh, the senator from the 39th had been placed inside of, quote, a paddy wagon. I went over to my colleague and asked, what is going on and why are you here? It was then that I was greeted by one of the officers and I asked that particular officer, why are you arresting one of our colleagues that's in session in this body? Uh, that officer directed me to Lieutenant Wicker who was standing up in the foyer area of the Capitol. I left the wagon, walked across the street, went over and spoke to Lieutenant Wicker and I asked him, Lieutenant Wicker, why are you arresting one of our colleagues? I said, you need to let her out of that van. Uh, Lieutenant Wicker said, Senator, I don't know if they knew she was a senator when they arrested her. I said, none of that matters now. You know right now that she is, in fact, one of the members of this body. I said, you need to let her out of the wagon. Uh, Lieutenant Wicker said to me, he said, Senator, 
And I don't normally share private conversations, but this is important, and I think all of you need to know this. He said, Senator, as soon as the wagon leaves the campus, we will release her. Let me repeat that again. He said, Senator, as soon as the wagon leaves this campus, we will release her. I went back over to my colleague. I shared with her as best I could without, because there were other members, other people inside that wagon. I told her that you were going to be OK. I just spoke to Lieutenant Wicker. This is where the story goes horribly wrong. I don't know if Lieutenant Wicker lied to me or someone above him overruled what he had shared with me. We shook hands. And I thought that was the end of the story, only to find out it was just the beginning of the story. Because I, too, remember, I, too, heard the story on the news last night that my colleague from the 39th had been booked into a prison over in Fulton County. And just imagine how any of you may have felt knowing that you were told by Lieutenant Wicker, a member of the State Patrol, that they were going to release her, only to find out on the news that that really wasn't the case. I want to read something to you, and I asked my colleague for the 39th for this privilege to do so. And it simply says on paragraph 9, it talks about the privilege that we have as members of this body. And it says, the members of both houses shall be free from arrest during sessions of the General Assembly or committed meetings thereof. And in going thereto or returning therefrom, except for treason, felony, or breach of the peace, no member shall be liable to answer in any other place for anything spoken in either house or in any committee meeting of either house. Folks, this arrest was a clear miscarriage of justice. And I submit to you that the Justice Department should investigate those members in this state patrol in this great state that saw fit to eviscerate our Constitution. I don't know how you feel, but I can tell you I am angry as hell and saddened that one of our members who was served in this body diligently had to go through what she went through. Her story was personal. My story is about anger and about justice, of which I fully intend to meet with the Department of Justice so I can file a complaint on her behalf. This never, ever should have happened, and I pray that it never happens again in this body. Thank you, Senator. Senator from the 41st, do you wish to be recognized at this time for a point of personal privilege? Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. As many of you know, this is a high honor of each of us to represent more than 200,000 citizens in our districts down here at the state capitol to bring their wishes and concerns forward and try to implement legislation that will make their lives better. We all take that responsibility extremely seriously. And we should understand that we have to protect each and every member to have the same rights that we would expect, to have their voices heard, have the ability to represent their constituents. The state constitution, paragraph 9, privilege of members of General Assembly, outlines that members of General Assembly should not be basically prevented from serving their constituents, from voting or attending committee meetings, unless there was a treason, a felony, or breach of peace, that no member shall be liable to answer any other place for anything spoken in either House or Senate, House or in any committee meeting in either House. Certainly you could subjectively say uh, whether a committee is in operations and we can discuss, and we're not going to argue the nuances or whatever. We, we know people in the past have tried to use this in ways that it was not intended to get out of this or that. 
but I charge this General Assembly, I charge this governor with reviewing the processes in place in the Capitol to make sure the voices of Georgia citizens are heard. You know, over the last few years, we've seen for security purposes, for uh, concerns that have existed on the national scene here, we have seen doors to the Capitol, entrances and exits. When I first got here, you could come in four sides of the building, leave through four sides of the building, leave on two floors on three sides of the building. But, you know, we've seen access to the Capitol diminish. We've seen notifications about the amount of people in the building. We have seen more restrictions as far as the type of protest allowed, not only in the Capitol, but on the steps and around the Capitol. And we need to make sure, and I charge the governor and us, our leadership, with making sure we're as open as possible to the citizens of Georgia. Not only members of the legislature, but for all citizens. This is their house. This is where we connect with them, too. And we must be able to hear from the people of Georgia to do the most effective job. We should not shut down areas for them to congregate or speak to us unless it is to conduct business effectively. I talked to members of the House. The protest that was going on downstairs was not something that most of them were aware of. It wasn't disturbing the conduct of their business. So I charge the leadership of the General Assembly and the governor to look at those issues and to make sure that police are well trained, to make sure that they do not overstep their authority in a moment of heat or anxiousness. You know, I also charge citizens to continue to come and speak to us. We need their voices. We need to understand their concerns. We need to understand their frustrations more now than ever before. As challenges face our state, we work together to solve their concerns, but we do it better when we listen to the people of Georgia. Mr. President, members of the Senate, I ask for you to help each of us fully be able to speak for our constituents. And I want each of you to understand that myself and every member of our caucus feels that Senator from the 39th was acting appropriately. As she has already stated, she did not tell anybody, don't arrest that person or stand in someone's way. She was acting appropriately, talking to constituents and saying, standing with them. So I hope you will all stand with us to make sure that each member here gets to fully serve in their duties as a Georgia State Senate and to keep the important integrity of our democracy intact by allowing our voices as representatives of the citizens of Georgia to be heard in committee rooms, in the chamber, in the hallways, on the steps, in the streets, and in our neighborhoods. Thank you for listening to me today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Chair, can I Senator from the 2nd, and then the Senator from the 29th will be uh, the last one. Thank you, Mr. President. I stand today in support of the Senator of the 39th. And along with the Senator of the 39th, 15 other distinguished individuals of this great state that was involved in a peaceful movement. Um, and they were involved in this movement for one reason, to talk about making every vote count. And in, in this great state and around this country, we are a free democracy where every vote should count. But I'm here to tell you that this was a peaceful protest. There was no violence, no arguments, no, no, no pushing, no shoving. It was not a treasonous act. It was not a felony act. And there's some question whether or not it was a breach of the peace. And we all know that's a great term for all the legal minds, but people who represent this great state, as we in this chamber should be heard, all of us as senators and house members should be heard, and we represent the people of this great state. So we all have titles, but I'm here to let you know that titles do not make the person. The person makes the title. So when we stand up for right, 
when we stand up for righteousness, when we stand up for purpose, we should not be humiliated, we, not should, be, we should not be tagged, we should, should not be handcuffed, and certainly we should not be tossed in jail. Thank you. Chair recognized Senator from the 29th on a point of personal privilege. Well, Mr. President, uh, this week marks the end of the rather ridiculous exercise referred to as the Amazon HQ2 sweepstakes. Um, they selected, not surprisingly, more than one location after promising 50,000 jobs in a single location. Uh, they picked three locations, New York City, uh, Crystal City, Virginia, and Nashville, Tennessee. What is interesting about two of those locations that are going to receive 30,000 jobs and billions of capital investment. They have and have had on their books for many years a state religious freedom restoration act. Now after four years of seeing full page ads taken out in the newspaper and people saying oh if you protect the religious freedom of your constituents uh, you can't attract businesses. I don't expect to see a banner headline that two of the locations for Amazon protect their citizens' religious freedom. Simply treat free exercise the way we treat every other right in the First Amendment. But I think you ought to also, as you consider the fact that, in fact, this has been uh, a lie that has been told and propagated for the last four years that should be cast aside uh, as future legislators debate this topic, I think you should also look at what those states did to get uh, these uh, economic development deals. The state of Virginia has agreed to amend its open record statute to create an Amazon exception to the open records law. They've obligated themselves for 25 years uh, to these various incentives. Amazon can get out of it with notice in five days. Um, so the idea that we are going to continue to spend billions of dollars, Georgia's proposal was over two billion dollars. You know, we can't print money like Washington, D.C. Imagine what could be done for law enforcement officers that need to be paid at a reasonable rate. Imagine what could be done for rural health care. Imagine what could be done for broadband access with $2 billion. Um, so, Mr. President, I would simply say two things. One, let's finally end this charade and make it very clear that we can protect religious freedom and have economic prosperity. And let's divest ourselves of this notion that paying $48,000 a job, as the state of New York has done, is good for the citizens and taxpayers. Thank you, Mr. President. Chair recognized Senator from the 15th. Thank you, Mr. President. I, too, rise to uh, speak to the incident that occurred involving the senator from the 39th yesterday, a very unfortunate incident. And I, for one, would like to go back to the comments made by the, today's chaplain about controversial issues and how that we should always look at things through uh, how it affects, uh, how would we uh, respond to things if it affected someone we care about, or uh, how would we feel if it were our daughter, our wife, or someone else in our family, or a dear friend for that matter. I would like to caution us to make sure that this kind of thing does not happen uh, to anyone else in the General Assembly under the circumstances that occurred yesterday. I, too, uh, spoke to an, an officer um, and I got the impression that something else occurred as opposed to what the senator from the 39th said. We should always make sure that we are equal in the exercise of the law, how we perceive justice, but more importantly, how we dispense justice, and more importantly than that, how our law enforcement people respond to anybody, not only an elected official. I believe that Georgia has a great future, but we must always be vigilant to make sure that this kind of thing never happens again. 
because I think it was a, 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 a probably hasty act. And I believe that the senator identified herself as a senator according to what everybody said, that she was peaceful, there was no kicking, screaming, or even part of the chanting. She was just there and she was arrested. And I think that was not fair. And we should always, across the aisle, Democrats, Republican, men, women, black, white, we should also always demand that we treat each other fairly and make sure that justice is always that is what is on our mind and keep our eye on that standard always. Put God first, uh, family, and then make sure we look out for one another, all right? Thank you very much. God bless. Is the senator from the 56, is he in the ante room? 56. Okay, we are uh, ready to conclude our business. Um, what I would like to do in light of um, obviously the activities uh, that occurred yesterday and the comments regarding the, through the points of personal privilege uh, surrounding the senator from the 39th is uh, ask the senator from the 56th, uh, who is our public safety chairman to, uh, to work with the senator, not just from the 39th, but also law enforcement to uh, look at uh, the, the facts surrounding this issue and see if we can bring uh, some kind of resolve um, to uh, to the matter at hand. Uh, so uh, the senator from the 56 will, as a chair, will take that responsibility on. I've communicated with him and he's willing to do so. With that, uh, I would also like to um, introduce the newly elected majority leader of the State Senate uh, yesterday, the Senator from the 30th. Please give him a great round of applause. The new, and the new Majority Leader gets his first 
real task, which is a very difficult one, but one that I'm confident that he will rise to the occasion and meet. Chair recognizes the majority leader. Mr. President, I move that the Senate stand adjourned until 10 a.m. Thursday, November 15, 2018. Thank you, Senator. Are there any announcements? The newly elected majority leader has moved. The Senate stand adjourned until 10 a.m. Thursday, December the 15th. All of those in favor of the motion will say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. The ayes clearly have it. We stand adjourned.